Two weeks ago, we dissected the president's constitutionally mandated State of the Nation address to Parliament. Today, the NDC held a major event to put across what they call the true state of the nation. And tonight, we're going to dissect that too and interrogate what the NDC believes to be the actual state of the nation. And thankfully, I have the General Secretary of the party with me in the studio. I want to go through first, just summarize, for those of you who possibly just getting home and wondering, so what did the NDC say? It was addressed by the national chairman, as you see in the background there. And we've summarized a few of the things they've said for you before we sit down for a conversation. One of the things they said is that um, they, they talk about the vaccines, right? And they, they mentioned that if we are talking about the true state of the nation, that the true state of the nation is the fact that we recently had the vaccine shortage that led to measles outbreak. They talk about, of course, the debt restructuring program that they believe historically we haven't seen its kind before in this country. They talk about the cruel uh, financial haircuts, again, something that we haven't seen before. And that's one of the key things that they also highlighted as a current true state of the nation. And then the ratings downgrade into junk status and that the country is bankrupt. Some of the things that they talked about today. Uh, still in summary, and they make the point that Ghana has for the first time a more than a half a century defaulted in its debt obligations and that as we've seen is actually a factual representation of things that's why the finance minister yesterday left and is expected in china on wednesday to continue with negotiations with the chinese to forgive us our debt we've we've frozen payments uh, of debts when it comes to the external debt for a while now uh, there are debts locally that are still outstanding the ndc says that really is a true state of the nation they talk about youth unemployment being high they actually talk about the Bank of Ghana's role. Many have criticized the Bank of Ghana's role in the restructuring process in the current state of the economy. The NDC points to that as a true state of the nation. They also talk about the, the president's refusing to cut down the size of the government in the midst of an economic crisis. And they took a stand uh, with the, um, in the diplomatic community. Remember the story that we, we did like, some time ago when the German ambassador criticized this government? for refusing to reduce the size of government while asking for debt relief. Well, the NDC says that really is a reflection of the current state of the nation. So those are a few of the things that the NDC had talked about today um, when the General Secretary addressed the nation. And they also touched on a few of the things that the President had been saying and fact-checked the President. So one of the things that the President said that we are a proud nation, we know how to uh, fix the economy, but we don't know how uh, to raise people for the debt. They said, well, as you've seen, it's difficult for them to fix the economy. They talk about the fact that the president said no haircuts. We've seen haircuts. The government promised to abolish road tolls. The road tolls are back. A few of the things that he mentioned in terms of what is pretty obvious. And then we decided to say, okay, we've seen the NDC's own true state of the nation. Can we also do a fact check of the NDC's true state of the nation? And we, there are a few things that we found that we thought were interesting. So one of the claims that the NDC made today was that the uh, government mobilized 30 billion dollars uh, when it comes to 30 billion CDs when it comes to the entire COVID-19 mobilization. They talked about the fact that 11.7 billion of that was spent specifically on COVID-19 expenditure, whilst as you see here, 18 billion was for budget support. If you read the Auditor General's report, they have you know slightly different numbers uh, for us to see in the Auditor General's report. Um, 2.1 billion is the total mobilization. According to Auditor General, 11.7 billion, which tallies, by the way, with what the NDC had said, the discrepancy is in 30 billion CDs. That's against the Auditor General's 21 billion CDs. And then you see the discrepancy again that we saw between those two documents, from the NDCs, and of course, what we saw here being 10.1 billion on, on budget support. I must indicate, though, remember that when we did the show ab around the Auditor General's report, we broke that down. We said, the Auditor General actually didn't audit at least three other sources when it came to the COVID-19 expenditure. We fact-checked that. And so that leaves a gap. But the NDC needs to explain where the discrepancy, what is it, that we have done a fact-check. We saw the gaps there. We'll see what NDC says when we said that. The other claim is debt to GDP ratio in 2016 was uh, 56%. If you look at the debt to GDP ratio, as we found back then, according to the Bank of Ghana, was 55.6%. Uh, of course, I mean, if you're doing the uh, conversions, you, you, if you're NDC, of course, the higher the number, the bigger your story is, the sweeter your story is. So they've done the, 
you know, those tiny little numbers, but for economies, they matter. And then you look at the uh, GDP debt to GDP ratio in 2019, the Bank of Ghana puts it at 61.2%, the NDC was 70%. So that, those are discrepancies between official GEO uh, Bank of Ghana numbers and what the NDC also put out. And thankfully, I have the man who sets the record straight with me in the studio. I'm looking forward to having a conversation with him. But then you look at this table here is something that the NDC have talked about and it completely checks out. If you look at the annual debt uh, increase between 2017 to 2022, um, this is what the NDC put out today and it checks out um, when you compare to what the actual data where the, the Bank of Ghana actually says. So, so this is where we are uh, with our debt as of 2022. In fact, there's the latest one that we brought you on the show when we're looking at our debt numbers that puts it slightly up above this but if you're looking at it within the 2022 figures it checks out um, and because the NDC puts it at 455 billion which by the way is according to the official numbers as well so we'll sit down and begin to have a conversation about why the NDC felt the need to deliver their own state of the nation address and what I recall really tend to happen was that normally it is the MPs in Parliament who hold their own press conference and give us what they believe to be their true state of the nation. But this time, the party chose to, to lead that particular delivery. And so I wonder what, what influenced that. And thankfully, if you quit, was in parliament. He used to be part of the people who possibly would have put this together for the members of parliament to deliver shortly or days after you would have seen a minority press conference where they will put out what the state of the nation is. So there's a lot of things to, to, to talk about. This is the government in waiting. And so we also ask the question about, okay, so they're criticizing what the state of the nation is right now. What is their alternative? You want to stay with me? I'm pretty sure you will like a conversation with uh, Fifi Kwete. Always a delight to talk to him. And he is my guest tonight, as you see in the background. Stay with me after this break. We'll get to the details. And thanks for staying with us. My guest in the studio is the General Secretary of the NDC, coming off the back of a major event by the party at the UPSA. Thank you very much, Fifi Kwete, for your time again. Thank you so much, on PM uh, Express. Brother Evans, and I'm happy to be here. Really again, to yes. all your many, many viewers across the country and beyond. Great to have you. So give me the, the thinking that went into the, the true state of the nation address. And I was making the point that normally you would you'd have seen the uh, your MPs in parliament leading the charge because of what they debated and then you see a press conference you know the, 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 the minorities mm -hmm. you know alternative state of the nation address but the party did grand event today mm -hmm. what's the thinking behind this this strategy oh uh, i think the um, the address was delivered by effectively the leader of the npp uh that's the president uh, the current leader of the NDC at the moment is the chairman of the NDC. Uh, and so we go to uh, Congress and elect uh, the flag bearer, who then becomes the leader. Uh, the chairman is the leader. So if you have a major state of the nation address delivered by the president, what we do is to have, um, at the moment, uh, the equivalent of the leader of our party delivering that. And uh, basically, it's a one team anyway. So whatever information is available at the different levels so the party can be brought together and be and be, and be delivered by okay, so this is a collation of effective different parts of the party coming together to effectively. to put this for the as you get here to articulate it on okay. behalf of the party okay so i'm curious then yeah. why really was the reason why you felt you had to give an alternative view of the reality when the president had delivered his constitutional mandate okay. and your mps in the house have actually debated it for almost two weeks yeah. Yeah, uh, even the truth is, is that um, we, we would have thought that given the crisis uh, this country is in at the moment, uh, crisis of uh, the magnitude that we have never seen before, a nation that is on its knees, uh, a nation that has become virtually what you call um, the object of ridicule and scorn, not just in the global I mean, reality, but actually even in the sub-region. Uh, we would have thought that with such grave situation, uh, the president of, 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 of our country in delivering the State of the Nation address would show 
um, the levels of humility and also the levels of uh, candor to be able to accept what the real situation is and what has caused that situation. Unfortunately, what we saw was a president who almost as though he's actually not aware of what is happening. He's still in what you call um, a campaign mode. For him, his preoccupation is how to look good for the sake of winning an election. It tells you how grave the situation is. Because I would have thought that given that he has actually run now what, into his seventh year, he has no election ahead of him. And given the, gra the gravity of the situation, he would have risen above, that's what I call, that campaign mode, and move into a level of a, of a statement to talk about what truly is assailing this country, what the ailment of the country is, and have that humility to accept that without even being worried. Because at the end of the day, you are not running anymore, so you can have the counter and humility. But no. But he admitted but. in the speech that we are in a crisis. <laughs> You know, when, for instance, you find it difficult, difficult to accept that the crisis in which we are is a crisis that actually is our doing for the most part. Because if that were not the case, we should see that crisis affect all countries around us. When you fail to admit that, it simply means that you simply have reached levels where you are completely unrepentant. You have no remorse. You have no humility. You refuse to accept the truth. I can understand if the statement were coming from one of the, shall I call it, those who are trying to become flag bearer. And therefore they are desperate because they are running for an election next year. But this is coming from you. Virtually an outgoing president. You must be able to step onto that platform and think about your country first and not what you call winning off an election. Is that Ukraine and COVID? Was he lying? Of course he was lying. Of course he was lying. Why? He knew he was lying. Because if Ukraine and COVID were the problem, then why were we having problems with this economy even before COVID 2019? Why did the World Bank country director say clearly that the economy of Ghana already was facing serious challenges even before COVID in 2019? Why was the city depreciating by close to 13% even before COVID? Why were we having budget deficit in the region of 7.57% before COVID? Why was the debt stock already rising beyond 120 billion level, pushing towards getting towards 225, 230 billion before COVID? It tells you there's a president who simply does not want to tell the truth. I've heard the, I read the thing and you've mentioned the World Bank, you've mentioned some other figures. However, uh -huh. currently, our, the verdict on our economy has been delivered by the IMF. Of course, we are going to the IMF for a bailout. Listen to the IMF Managing Director, um, Kristalina Georgieva, who spoke just in February, quote, we recognize that we are in a world in which exogenous shocks more often than before hit innocent bystanders. Ghana has been working towards good policies for quite some time, and then COVID-19 and Russia-Ukraine war hit, and that significantly undermined Ghana. Oh, yeah. That is the IMF making the point that it is not our fault. We were, quote, innocent bystanders. Oh, all right. What about that Nigeria? agrees with the president. What about Nigeria? What about Benin? What about Togo? What about Cote d'Ivoire? What about Burkina Faso? Innocent bystanders? Let's talk these lies. But it's IMF. It doesn't matter who said it. The IMF is lie. lying. It doesn't matter who said it. It's just I'm surprised you said that. Because it that is a lie. our economic survival no, depends on the IMF now. Well, let me tell you why it's a lie. It's a lie. IMF is simply trying to <laughs> create, you know what? You are already in a disgrace. They know that you are political force. These are some of the lies you've been telling, feeding your country. So, okay. If that is what makes you happy, we'll, we'll go along with some of that for you, as long as you do what we want you to do. But let's face the truth. The truth is this. If we were innocent bystanders, then why are the countries around us not having exactly the same condition? Why have they not become a junk economy as we speak? Why is their inflation not above 50% as we speak? Why don't we have a situation where their debt to GDP has gone over 100% as we speak? Why, do you, what, what, why don't they have the debt, what you call deficit of over, over in double digit as we have? 
Why are their pensioners not picketing and able to know the, the, the fortune of their, of their pension funds? So, it obviously, it's not the case. Even, let me tell you the real tragedy. I can understand a president desperate to lie. A president unable to tell the truth. Because the truth is what the case is. It is not we are dealing with a president who simply is not able to tell the truth. But let me tell you what the worst situation is. The worst situation is that it is even a debate. Even this should not be a debate. When you and I sit here for the sake of the people of Ghana, there should be no debate. There should be complete clarity and, and, and consensus over the fact that the situation in which we are is largely the doing of the government. But you don't disagree there should be no debate about that it. Ukraine and COVID has had a significant impact on our economy. Ukraine and COVID have a significant impact on many economies. That's what we've seen in Benin in Togo, in Burkina Faso, in Guinea, in Rwanda, in Nigeria. We've seen that. Has he had that effect on them as he's having on us? Why is our case different? Our case is different because we have had a government that even long before COVID systematically lied about the true condition of our country. Hid our real debt situation in terms of the deficit, constantly lie and create the impression that the deficit was lower than it was. And when we told them, now listen, these lies, are going to come back to hound. You say, no, it's not true. Sino Hydro is not part of our debt. And today, Sino Hydro is back as part of our debt. And so many of that. Because their preoccupation, right from the word go, is how to deceive the people in order to look good for purposes of election. When you reduce the governance of a country to PR for purposes of winning an election, what you do is to sink that country. And that's exactly where we are today. We are talking, you see, the crisis we have in Ghana today, it's true, it's an economic crisis. But even much more than that, it's a crisis of what I call character. It's a crisis of what I call credibility. We are dealing with, we are, we are, we are dealing with the most discredited government in the history of our country. A government that repeatedly, repeatedly lies. But this is a government, you say most discredited, but this is a government that only just over a year ago, in fact, in 2020, two years, mm -hmm. got a reaffirmation yeah. by the people. Mm -hmm. So why, what, that is, that is the, the ultimate endorsement yeah. of a government, is it not? That's wrong. But you know, humans sometimes do what you call like giving a long rope. The you people know, of Ghana? Yeah, they can give you a long rope. But especially, they don't forget. Especially in our, in our situation where people tend to think, that, you know, four years is really not too, too long. But Let's John, but John, Mahama, but John Mahama found out that the Ghanaians... Ghanaians do not necessarily think about four eight years. If they really believe in you, they'll give you a, a second term, no. which is really what they did for NPP. No. In, even in the case of in the case of Mahama, it was a question of they look at the government. They felt the government has had an eight year. So why not? Let's give it an opportunity to another government. That's exactly what happened. In the case of Nana Kufa, it's exactly the same thing. Four years, even though we can see that this is a group that does not tell the truth. We can see this a group that's very insensitive. We can see this a group that actually covers even corruption. This is a group that fight people who are fighting corruption. This is a group that does not want to show credibility. But why not? It's just four years. Let's give an opportunity. Maybe they could do better. So to use winning election in 2020 to say that somehow takes away the fact that this is the most discredited government in the history of our country. It, it, it's not the case at all. That, I'm, but but isn't that the ultimate judge of a government success, that you go to an election and the people vote for you, which is that they believe that your policies are right? Remember the context of the 2020 election? Yeah. It was COVID. Mm -hmm. Government was doing, I guess, fixing the COVID challenges, and the people endorsed that. Mm -hmm. The government says, that solution that we put forth, mm -hmm. For which reason you voted for us? There's a reason why, largely, we are in this debt crisis. You, you should actually. I don't really want. I don't want really want. I don't want us to go so much into the election year in and all. We've we've debated yeah, yeah. Uh, so much. But even look at even that result properly. Result that is procured uh, through killing of about eight pe eight people on an election day. It's not any. It's not an election. Any any any. Should I call it a uh, um, credible leader want to boast about. I don't want to win an election through killing of eight people. I actually don't want to win an election that obviously the opposition has, come, has defeated me at least in a parliamentary election. 
and they had to use all kinds of shenanigans to try to take away those seats from them. So anybody who wants to actually boast about that election, especially on the part of our friend, uh, should actually be looking at himself. I don't think it's an election anybody wants to boast about. But let's go back to the issue. Mm -hmm. The issue is simple. Where we are today is simply a result of the complete collapse as far as what you call the credibility of this government is concerned. So the chicken are just coming home to us. Every single thing shows that the problem we have today is simply because they have lied right from the beginning and have persisted in a lie. And that lie has simply has caught up with them. And today they have nowhere to hide. But the sad thing is you would have thought that with all the problems they've had, this is the moment where you say, you know what, enough, I've lied enough. Let me now finally start telling the truth. Let me tell the people the truth exactly. Let them know that, you know, I was even lying about the deficits in the past. I was lying about his economic numbers in the past because I just wanted to look good. At the end of the day, if they are told, for example, the truth about the real deficit of the country and how that was getting so astronomical, they would have sought the help of IMF. They were so arrogant. We don't need IMF. We are a proud nation. We, we are capable of reviving the economy. And all that arrogance, which is simply built on their deception, is eventually what has led us to this catastrophic situation. One of the examples you cited is that they lied about the deficit. How? What was, was the evidence that it's they not, did? You know, for instance... You, because if they did, you, I would have pulled them out. Oh, no. Let, let me give you a typical scenario. For example, when we were in office, uh, when we took over in 2009, uh, we came and we met uh, a deficit situation. Uh, we could have decided that uh, things that had to do with payment of, uh, let's say, tall debt, which really was not our fault at all, we came and inherited them. When we were taking care of that, we could have hidden it and put it below, below the line. But we actually accounted for that as part of the deficit. That's what you do when you're credible. You tell the country the truth. That you know what? This is how much my revenue is. This is what my expenditure is. And this is the real deficit situation. But they try to be clever. Try to be clever in order to deceive the people that, you know what? Even our deficits are that low. The image is nothing but PR. Because that is who they are. But what's the what's what's proof? Spin. What's the proof that there was a deficit manipulation? Ah, but that is historical. I mean, I'm, I'm, historical. I, but, but I just I, mentioned Sinohydro, for instance. They pretended, for example, Sinohydro was not debt. They were the, if yeah. they had told the truth about Sinohydro, that would have been accounted as part of the deficit. The country then would have known the real debt to GDP situation. And we would have known that this situation is getting serious. And the government itself would have been seeking answers on the back of the reality, which is that the debt situation is getting very precarious. If you recall. But when you hide it, when you hide it, it's almost like the, the parlance in Ghanaian language. When they say if your mother is dead and you are pretending your mother is alive, the rottenness is going to us, it will expose you. That's exactly what has happened. They kept lying and lying and lying and eventually... But, but, but on, on Sino-Hydro, yeah. I remember it was a significant debate in Parliament mm -hmm. whether or not you should treat it as part of our national mm -hmm. debt or not. Mm -hmm. I remember the minority writing to the IMF for clarification mm -hmm. on this. In fact, a case that of forcing mm -hmm. did. The IMF wrote back mm -hmm and disagreed with the minority position at that time. What is the situation today? Well, of course, when they did, when, when they did the death sustainability because analysis, that was what it, it was all part. along. That was what it was all along. We actually told the IMF that you were actually treating them with kids' gloves because that's what the situation should have been right from the wet go. Right from the wet go. And that is what the reality has become today. So that's the point I'm making. That's systematic. And that's not all. That's not the only one. They did the same thing with Get Fund. They did the same thing with various other, I mean, uh, what you call money that they were borrowing, constantly he said that no, it's not part of the national debt. We actually were various SOEs are able to take care of it themselves. Meanwhile, you know that all those are contingent liabilities. And today it has proven to become the reality of the day. So we are dealing with a government that systematically has lied. And that lie is what has led us to this situation today. So the difficulties we see today, as I, as I told you, is a, is, a, is a result of the systematic deception that they've engaged in the lack of humility on their part, the arrogance on their part, and they're thinking that governance is all about spin and spin and spin to deceive in order to be able to win an election. If you start to appreciate that governance fundamentally is about I mean, changing the conditions of the people, delivering the things that you promise, not with exaggerated, what you call, I mean, fanfare, but just doing what you got to do, you, the country is a much better country for it. Let's talk about one of the key things that you, with corruption. You, you say in your, in your real state of the nation that the nation where journalists who are net corruption are harassed, intimidated, and sometimes murdered. You mentioned Ahmed Swale. You criticize the, the government's corruption record. But you have to remember that this is the same government that passed the, 
that created the special prosecutor's vehicle. Yeah. And how did the, the special prosecutor out? Well, did he? The man, the man resigned. Of course. How, why did he resign? Well, what he, 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 he because resigned. he realized that he couldn't do any work because the president, who is supposed to be the one to allow that to, to I mean, what you got the fight to, 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 to continue, that president himself, he called him the mana serpent of all corruption. The mana serpent of all corruption. He is the one who actually came out to expose the fact that we are dealing with somebody who makes, who makes pronouncements about fighting corruption, but deep down and in essence does not believe in anything about fighting corruption. And of course, Domino also showed the same thing. They hounded him out as well. The, the same thing they've done to various other people. Domino who, 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 who had to retire. Oh, I see. It's so convenient, right? But it's, it's so convenient. But it's, but it's a set aim and you for think if And you think if Domino were playing according to his, their games and, and covering them up and not exposing them, you would have handed him out? Of course they would not have handed him out. They got him out because he was playing a game that was exposing them and they didn't want people to expose him. So that's exactly who they are. They, make, they say one thing, but they do the very opposite. Because for them, this game is all about deception, deception, deception. Spin and spin and spin. They believe that once you continue doing so, the ordinary people will not see through and somehow you can continue winning the election. That's all they, co they are concerned about, winning an election. That's all they are concerned about. You're almost suggesting that the Ghanaians had been fooled by this government. Oh, but you know what? You can sometimes have a situation where somebody that you trusted can actually play you for a fool. And then later on, you awaken and realize, wow, this guy actually had played me. That's exactly what they've done. They've actually played the people of Ghana. These are the people who came and said, well, they're changing this, count this country's economy from what, taxation to production. In this case, well, of course, Ghanaians believe them. What has happened today? <laughs> from one taxation to the next. This is the same group that said, this, and, I mean, uh, taxation is a lazy man's approach to governors. What is the situation today? It's not the same group that said that we are not going to go to IMF. The IDC government does lack no policy credibility. We have credibility. We are not going to IMF today. What is the situation today? So this is a group that simply, excuse the word, <laughs> they con. That's what they do. They do a con job. But the people of Ghana, I believe, are completely awake. They have seen exactly that these guys cannot be trusted. These guys have no credibility. And once the people of Ghana are awake, trust me, it's, it's end, 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 end game for them. You, you, you talked a lot about what this government had done, but do you admit that the current challenges that the context of this economic crisis is unprecedented. No government has faced this uh, you know, conspiracy of factors. What conspiracy? You have a pandemic. A pandemic. Nigeria, you have Nigeria not Ukraine. I mean, uh, we, we, we've it's discussed probably, a lot about... Is Cote not having the same? I'm just, they don't have any I, excuse. I, I, I'm, just, I'm just saying, you, you, you don't admit no, that no in, in the history of this, of, this, no, of this country... They have no excuse. No government has faced this much challenge in terms of fixing an economy. That's not true. That's which, not true. Point, point, point which government... I can, I can point, point me any government in our history that had come close to dealing with... A, a pandemic. Okay, let me give you. And, let me give and you. And the Ukraine tell, war that directly let me, impacts let me our tell you what I'm telling you is not true at all. We're talking about the government that has been actually been the most, should I call it, the luckiest government in terms of resources. The amount of resources that have come into the hands of this government is absolutely unprecedented. COVID alone, COVID alone gave this government so much money. In fact, imagine this: that between 2009 to 2016. The total money that we borrowed, domestic and external, if you put it together, will be about 110 billion. 110 billion. Because we came in at the time, it was about 10 billion. And the time we were living, it was 120 billion. So 110 billion. And imagine that just in one year, one year, a government is having access to, in the region of 20 to 30 billion, just for COVID. Just for COVID alone. That's how much? That's about one-fifth of the totality of the debt that one government had for eight years. You have that in one year. And you still finish that year with almost 16% deficit. Because they had an unprecedented challenge. What, what, what challenge? What challenge? If you have over 20 billion cities available to you just within one year, and in that year, you were getting access to this money also somewhere around July, August. So almost like after, almost like five months to go. Five months to go. And you still money to leave a non-precedented deficit of 16%? It's criminal. So what are we talking about? They have no excuse. 
They've had the, the, I mean, the greatest resource envelope in our history, and they still have left the most calamitous, the most disastrous economy in our history. There's no excuse at all for them. Talking about the COVID, I mean, clarify this. I saw you, you in your statement, in your state, in true state of the nation, you talked about 30 billion mobilized for COVID-19. Mm -hmm. Auditor General puts it down at 21.8 billion. Mm -hmm. um, how do you explain that discrepancy? Oh, I mean, these are numbers. I believe we, we, can, we can always uh, uh, go to be, to, be, to be specific. I leave that to, to our number crunches. I trust them that their number they have produced will, will be the correct thing. But it's something that we can, we can, we can subject to. to, to and, and then, and, and then the, in terms of GDP, you went back to make a point that uh, your time when you were leaving, you let the GDP, uh, debt GDP ratio of 56%. I mean, yeah, I mean, you can argue the Bank of Ghana's number is 55.6%. I mean, mm -hmm. you could see that there's, there's a slight number yeah. of difference there. Yeah. But the significant one, though, is debt to GDP ratio in 2019 of 70%. The Bank of Ghana put that down to 61.2%. The, the reason why I find this to be significant is that it, you, you're exaggerating the numbers to make a point. If you have one... Almost 9% points. If you have a 103% uh, debt to GDP facing you today, then you actually should know that, but don't forget that, even the Bank of Ghana themselves, they've been, they've been obviously complicit in all this business. They've been part of this whole shenanigan that has gone on. You're not accusing them of they obviously money, have manipulating they've been the part of the well. game. They've been part of the game. They've been definitely part of the you game. You don't believe IMF. You don't believe Bank of Ghana. So who do you believe then? It's not. You said IMF lied. Now it's you say the Bank of it's Ghana. It's, so so, so it's, who, they, these are these are very reputable but, institutions. But you must you must look at what the facts are. The facts are that if it were a true situation that Ghana were just innocent bystanders, that COVID in Ukraine caused us to be where we are, then we should be seeing it all over. Yeah, I mean, we move so anybody, you, any, so I'm just letting you know. Yeah. When you say I say I don't believe in IMF. But, but the bank, the bank, be, the bank, bank of Ghana, IMF is being very diplomatic. The Bank of Ghana number IMF is just being very your debt to GDP. So I'm not, I'm not talking about this. Many will look at it and say, but the NDC yeah. is exaggerating the numbers to make the situation worse than it is. Okay. It can't be an exaggeration, though. That as we speak today, we're talking about a city that uh, in the first 11 months of last year depreciated uh, by what? Uh, in the region of 54%. Mm. That's massive. It's not an exaggeration, it's the truth. That for this year, first two months alone, we've done minimum for 20, 22% depreciation. Mm. It can't be an exaggeration. It can't be an exaggeration that inflation now is about 54%. Now, so these are the hard realities. Now, so to say that NDC is exaggerating, in fact, it is actually even better for them to have listened to exaggerated figures for them to do better than to continue hiding themselves in where, under the, under the bed. Yeah, but you remember that you, call themselves your couch is a true state. If it's true, it can be a lie, it can be exaggerated. No, the true state has to do with the genuine situation facing the people of Ghana. Yeah, but the genuine the suffering, situation... The suffering that is facing the, the people The genuine situation is bad enough, but for you to exaggerate it, then that becomes an issue. We obviously are not exaggerating the suffering. We are not exaggerating the, the fact that our pensioners are in trouble. We are not exaggerating the fact that even vaccines in the first time in our history, I can't remember how long, are in complete shortage. And even then, they are even lying. You see, we're just talking about people who can't tell the truth. Even they have to lie. That even that was a global problem. Every problem, everything in Ghana now is a global problem. The health problem. minister has since clarified. In a global, clarified what? In parliament. That, that when he said that it was a shortage, he wasn't referring to the, you know, World Health Organization. Even he had clarified that in parliament. What I played, what I played is that the people of Ghana must appreciate who it is we are dealing with, and together make an effort. Even if not NDC. The people of Ghana just have to realize that we are dealing with a group that simply would use every opportunity to simply spin for purposes of election. And therefore, we must constantly make sure the light is constantly being put on them in order to expose them for who they are. That's the only way we can salvage this country. That's the only way we can salvage this country. And you in the media must be the first to start that battle. It should not be a battle between NDC and MPP alone. It should be a battle where the truth must be told. And those who are in the middle, those who are facing the wrath and facing the pain, they must be the first to always make sure that the truth gets told. One more question I'll go to. Okay, so what is your alternative to fixing the problem since you believe the true state is very dire? Uh, in your statement, you said on when you were dealing with the bigger issues of the economy, you said, we further expect the government, this is your demands of the government, to be tolerant of dissent, heed the calls for implementation of the constitutional review recommendations. Keeping them honest, 
John Mahama had four years and never implemented the constitutional review recommendations himself. Your own government, this is your own baby, as Mills bequeathed to John Mahama. You didn't do it. Yeah. But you've put it in part of your truth to the nation address, now demanding another government that didn't work on it to do it. Keeping them honest. Some may say, but that's double standards. No, that's not what it is. But if you didn't do it, Father, Why do you think it's an issue the father, when the, the MPP father, didn't, the father, the father, hasn't taken the it up as well? We could, not, we could not do it. It does not mean that we were unwilling to do so. Yeah, but that's only, that's only means. No. It if we, mean if we didn't do it no. for four years, no. when you spend the 20 billion plus on it, 20 million plus yeah. dollars on it, yeah. and yet an NDC government takes over, uh -huh. in fact, the vice president becomes a, a yeah. president, and for four years they didn't do it. That definitely is a double standard. If you're no, asking your, not, if you're no, asking, no, if you're asking your your opposition party, I mean your new government to but, do it. But I would have thought the reason why one government is voted out for another government to take over is for that government to take it to the next level. That actually should be the obvious thing. Eh? So you cannot you cannot justify that the father NDC was unable to do it. Justify you not doing it. There were so many things MPP couldn't do. When we had opportunity, we actually came and did it. MPP, for example, went and uh, started last with what you call a gang of four, six roads. They didn't even have one dime for it. When we came, what did we do? We did it. There were so many things. They, they started off a single spine salary. We came and did it. That's what governance is about. You can justify yourself and say because somebody had a four years and therefore was unable to do. But what so that if the person had one power, you know, have done so? There is only an issue. Yeah. Because you're making it an issue under the NDC government. You are calling them out for not implementing it. Meanwhile, you failed to implement it too. No, when it was saying, your government that put saying, it together. We are just saying you took over what you call a country and the processes were in place. So even if they were not completed, make sure they get done. If for example we were, if for example we were building we were building rail lines and we couldn't finish, your job is to make sure it's done. But remember the context of this is to true state of the nation. Yeah, but it's to point the out the failings of the government. And you, you one of the failings of the government you are calling our attention to is your inability to implement the constitutional review recommendations. But that's a failing of yours too. Yeah, but then, does that mean that they're just does that Remember true state of an admission on your part. Remember you accuse the government of not being I, of not wanting to be humble and but we, admitting, but, but we are admitting. Not, but we are not in charge of the government. That, that's true. Country. No doubt about that. The people that. of Ghana expect but, but he who those come, who are in But charge. he who comes to equity must come with clean hands. You're accusing this government, yeah. remember, yeah. of not being honest, mm -hmm. lacking integrity. They were not telling the truth. Yeah. You have to admit it. But first. we haven't said that we have done it. It's not like we have both said that we've done it. But so, we are asking that, listen, if we are unable to do, your responsibility over the last seven years is to make, make sure it's done. You have still not unable to, you've not been able to do so. Okay. That actually should be... So the NDC is as through. guilty as the MPP on this particular call. Guilty in what way? That, and in fact, the NDC should have more incentive to implement than you did it for four years. Yeah. You admit that so then you've also admitted it's guilty. we believe it's an important thing. If we are unable to do it, you have had seven years be able to do something about that's it. That's true, yeah. but you, at least you admit that it was a failing on your part too, even though you had more incentive because you spent the money to put a review document together. Yeah, we could not do it, as I said. I mean, there's no dispute that we couldn't do. There, it's not everything that we could have done. I mean, over the, over the four years, there are so many more things that you could do. It's not everything that we could do. But if you have had the opportunity and have the huge resources that have been available to you over the last seven years, you clearly have no excuse. Let's look at the alternative. So today you spend a lot of time talking about the true state of the nation, and it's dire. Yeah. The president says it's a crisis, you say it's worse. You are government in waiting. Um, if your plans go according to what you expect, you possibly will be president. Mm -hmm. You possibly will have a president in the government in, mm -hmm. in, in January 7, mm -hmm. 2025. Sure. What, what, what will you do differently? What, what's, what's your solution to the crisis that we're in? What are you offering? What hope are you offering to the Ghanaians you, you, you talk to today? The most important one is to, is to clearly show much more responsibility. That's the first one. I mean, that, that underpins everything. You must show that you are far more responsible. And to be responsible means you must have the courage to start telling the truth to begin with. If you start telling the truth, it means over you are in a position now to start leveraging the, I mean, the support system that are available. So let's say, for example, I do not have an answer relating to a particular issue. For example, we had difficulties uh, between 20, especially 2014 to 2015. We admitted the difficulties. They were, they were able to, 
to have what you call a national economic dialogue. Mm -hmm. And we brought different people and said, oh, let's have a conversation about this economy and see how we can do something about it. That led to what you call a number of solutions. And those solutions effectively became exactly what was implemented when we went to the IMF. And we were able to do it in good time. We could have, we could have been irresponsible, remain arrogant, very stubborn and say, now we know how to manage the economy. We don't, we're not going to IMF and the economy would have crushed under us. And that's not the first time we have done a thing like that. We've done it severally. When we saw that there were genuine issues, we have that courage to say, you know what? Let's have a good conversation about this and move forward. That is the beginning. Show responsibility. Stop the arrogance. Stop the arrogance related, for example, about the refusal to cut down your government. Because that is a solution. So the NDC would have cut down government? Cut down government. Do something about the size of your government. The fact that we even have a situation where with all this crisis, with the country suffering haircut, the president and his government does not want to have what you call a government haircut. It's a tragedy. Because that's what you want to do. That's what, for example, the German ambassador will tell you. That you are coming to us pleading for us to help you to be able to have debt forgiveness. But you are keeping size of government that in our countries, that you expect our taxpayers' money to be used to help you, we do not keep. Yeah, the president actually arrogantly telling that they should, not, they should not meddle in Ghana's issue. A beggar with a choice. You are on your knees begging for help and you still have the arrogance to be able to speak the way you do. Show some humility. Go on your knees and show that you are really in trouble and ask for help. And stop showing the arrogance that you are showing. So that's an area where the president and his government should be able to do something. Do something about the size of your government. That's not all. Do something about a lot of what they call uh, uh, the, the wasteful expenditure. I don't know whether he has stopped with all these uh, 20,000 uh, uh, euro flights that he's been doing because thinking that this is supposed to be what some, some uh, uh, Saudi Arabia or some of those countries where you have so much money you can do anything with it. Mm. Show some humility in that respect as well. Show something, I mean, in, in terms of uh, ideas that will show clearly that you want to move away from, from the past. We did a number of those things. We moved, for example, a situation where apart from concentrating on what I call... Um, putting our money that were borrowed into real development infrastructure that would grow the economy and also some of those ones were sure that they were loans that were not directly incumbering the government mm. so for example we that's why you could see for example we allowing um uh ghana port and harbor to be able to leverage their own assets and be able to raise facility that today has delivered one of the largest ports, I mean, as far as West Africa is concerned, and also one of the best in the whole of Africa. The same for the airport. That is the kind of initiatives you, you want to put in place if you see yourself in trouble. So you must show those initiatives that clearly show that, first of all, you are conscious of the difficulty, and you want to start thinking about solutions that will be able to take this country out of difficulty. So that's one that you are being arrogant, you are being stubborn, you are refusing to show humility, you are showing no responsibility, you continue to lie, you, the, country, the country will continue to be in trouble. One of the biggest problems we face is the debt. Still talk about alternative. What, what, have been, what would have been your alternative to the current debt that we, we currently bed in? Where the government had chosen to do a, domet, a domestic debt exchange program. Mm -hmm. Very painful. Mm -hmm. You cited that many times in your speech today. Pensioners queuing and, and, and protesting. We've mm -hmm. not seen that before, etc. What would the NDC have done differently? In a if you're battered by COVID and Ukraine and everything else in the desert balloon, etc., all your let me, let me give you let me give you one of the things. For example, we did uh, the last time when we were in difficulty, we spent the whole of 2016 without one city coming from the central bank. Not one city came from the central. 2016, bank. The, year, 2016. The, the election year. That was an election year, which often is the place is the time when you decide to play rogue because after all, I need I need to win power by every means. So we could have... Somebody said you didn't, you didn't have, have a choice then. What do you mean you didn't the have IMF was you build, think, The IMF think, was building a cane over you. You think, you think MPP, MPP have, have, have any choices? No, but they didn't have, a, they didn't have the IMF wielding a cane over them in, when they were spending. It's not, you, you did in it's 2016. Not, it's not, it's not so you didn't have, have, a, you didn't have a choice. Takes, it takes what you call a government that wants to do what is right for the sake of his nation. Are you sure about that? That's exactly but you had the only factor then. That's exactly The only factor between... 2012, when you won the elections, mm -hmm. when you spent, mm -hmm. the evidence shows. In 2016, that 2012, you didn't have an IMF. 2016, you had an IMF. That's a, that's a factor. So it's many will point to that and say, not, that's possibly not, why you, we did not, you spend we did, within limits. We do not need IMF, for example, for us to set up what we call the, the sinking fund. The sinking fund, for example, that we set up. We set them up because we were conscious that if our time is going to come, we need to be able to take care of our debt. But we are talking about a group that actually is what you call consuming even future funds 
You understand? I mean, collateralizing everything and taking money that are not even due yet. It's simply about, for them, it's just today. We just want to have anything we can today. Virtually pillaging this country, destroying the very future, the future potential of the economy being destroyed, simply because all we care about is now. We are in power now, we'll get everything we can now. That's not how you go for the country. That's why this government must not just lose power, but must remain in opposition for as long as it takes, because that's the only way they will start learning that governance cannot be just about PR. Governance cannot just be about spin and lying and deception, sloganeering, deceiving people. Governance should be about genuine commitment to doing what is right for nation. Unfortunately, they've not proven that. One of the solutions you propose now, even in opposition, mm -hmm. is to use your members of parliament mm -hmm. to hold government's feet to the fire and get them to do some, the right things. One of the, you've instructed, and I, uh, many call it an unprecedented move, your MPs who stay in the House had the whole course until parliament, parliament rises. And from everything else we've read, it's because the um, minister designates, you want to make sure that they don't have your blessing because government needs to cut get down government first. So MPs, are, are, they, are they respecting and abiding by your dictates as you expected so far? Are you, are you monitoring it? Of course we are monitoring. Of course we are. And, 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 also, and also understand it. What we're asking of them is not just something that party leadership is asking. It's actually something that the nation is demanding. We're talking about millions of Ghanaians expect that. Even foreign government can see it and asking that it be done. How much more us? Now, so if there are any MPs, and I know, having been an MP myself, I do know. I mean, in, in the house you have what you call friendships. Now, what I want to, again, signal is us. The position that we are taking is not a position that is against any individuals. Some of those who are being, what you call, appointed, nominated, are friends of mine. But this position, a position for Ghana, we are saying that it is simply not right in the midst of this crisis to allow this government to continue keeping the size of the government that they do. The day the president decides that, you know, it is true. It's not only the NDC that's calling for it, the people of Ghana are calling for it, even foreign government are calling for it. Let me do something about the size of the government. They can, re they can, they can re-nominate, and some of those same individuals will have no issue. We have no problem with them as individuals. That's the problem we have is a principal position, and that principal position, we believe that our MPs are conscious that the, the, the burden they carry is not a burden that they're just carrying on behalf of the NDC, but much more, That's they're it. carrying that burden on behalf of the millions of Ghanaians who expect that something be done. As we speak, like Mr. Kwete, it's been more than a month since the vetting, <laughs> <laughs> and even the committee yeah. hasn't even produced a report for the House to consider. And from every indication, it's because of the posture you've taken. But, but and and because also we don't have a substantive yeah. agric minister, yeah. we don't have a substantive trade minister, yeah. But, but, even, have but even that, serious but, consequences. But even, but even that, I want to tell you exactly about the level of intransigence we have as far as the government is concerned. What does it take to be able to say, listen, this nation is going through real crisis. It's not asking for too much for me to be able to reduce the size of government. Mm. But we're talking about president, his vice, and the government. We just don't care. That's their attitude. We don't care. The country can go to anywhere. We are going to do what we've got to do. The boys must have jobs. The girls must have jobs. Let the whole country go through a haircut. We were not going to allow for any haircut as far as our governance is concerned. So that actually should be a cause for concern. The country should be looking at the president, his vice, and the whole government in real the state of insensitivity. The complete lack of what you call compassion. The complete awareness of how this country is suffering and the need for them to do. This is just minimum requirement. But it simply are too arrogant too insensitive to do a basic thing such as that. Eventually, this will come to the floor in our debate. I mean, Parliament is rising next week, so yeah. definitely between now and next week, this should be decided. Mm -hmm. I need to ask you, many, and you remember, you possibly would have noticed, the last time an issue like that about ministers being approved came up, mm -hmm. it sparked grassroots revolt in your party mm -hmm. because the people ended up being approved and they got votes from your members. Yeah. When the party was explicit yeah. that these individuals we don't want to touch, yeah. What do you say to your grassroots about the, the individual and the MPs who our our who, MPs who, who, our MPs I believe will rise to the occasion. Why? Because I think they understand that this is not just about the NDC; it's about the millions of Ghanaians who want this. 
It's about the fact that this country needs these signals at this moment in time. Because if this government is able to get away with some of these things, they are going to actually do even worse things. Now, if any of them cannot understand that this interest of this country remain paramount, being asked by the party, it simply means that they are not conscious yet of the gravity of the situation. And their constituents will actually take issues with them. Um, so, I think, have you instructed them to stay in the house and, and vote against it or they should leave? Because many say, this is a secret ballot, remember? To vote against it. So they should stay? Apps to vote against but it? But remember, it's a secret ballot. Yes, we know. Is that good? I'm going in addition to that. We know that. It's a secret ballot. Sure, we know. But you don't have the power. You, you don't know who. And this MPP learned that on the 7th of January 2021. Mm -hmm. That, yeah. that can, can prove disastrous for you. Yeah, we are aware. We've taken so, all that into so, consideration. So, so what are you doing? We are going to ensure that they do exactly as the people of Ghana expect of them to do. When, it, when it's what a secret million, ballot. What the millions of Ghanaians expect of them to do. To understand that this is nothing personal. You have a lot of faith. But not, you have a lot of faith in your 136 members of parliament. Yes, because I do understand. I do feel that they appreciate what is going on in this country. The gravity of the situation. And the cause, not just from NEC. Do you understand the consequence from the party? If they break ranks and possibly someone votes, and you may not even know the person. Do you yeah. understand? Have you told them what the how consequences you, How do you know we may not know? Well, and, and MPP hasn't found out the person who voted for Abang Bagbing still. So I guess that's why I'm, I'm, I'm believing that you may not know. I tell you that we will put mechanisms in place to be able to know. Okay. People great. Always a delight. Always a pleasure talking to you. Um, pleasure. And I will invite you back very soon. I'm pretty sure as we approach the crunch time. There's a lot of elections in your party that's going to happen, and then we're going to approach a major election year. So thank you again for coming. Absolutely. And the rest of the people.